On this week's U.S. Farm Report, a look at dairy farming in Vermont and New Hampshire. Also, a general coverall report on the NFO Dairy Commodity Department by its director, Mr. Ed Groff. So, stay tuned. everybody and welcome to U.S. Farm Report, seen on this station each week at this same time. A little later in our show, we will visit on film with two dairy farmers in Vermont and New Hampshire. But right now, our special studio guest, Mr. Ed Groff, who is the director of NFO's Dairy Commodity Department. Ed has promised today to give us a careful look at the past, present, and future of the Dairy Commodity Department and its successes with the National Farmers Organization. He has told me that he's going to talk about where we've been, where we are now, where we're going, and how we got there. Ed, where have we been? Well, Bill, I think it's important for all of us to know and understand where we have been. There have been several things that we've been doing in the past six or eight years in the NFO dairy program that have been very important. They have uh, given results. Sometimes I feel maybe we ought to go back and look at them. We get a better picture of our progress. Ed, I think it's basically true, whatever our endeavor, that our present and future are tied pretty solidly to our past. You bet, Bill, it's very important. Right now, where we are in this dairy program, we've gotten there because of some very specific steps that we've taken in the past. What have those steps been, Ed? Well, to begin with, I would say that for four years, we organized on a theory. Now, this was the beginning of NFO when we had an idea of a dairy program and how it would work. And we talked of a marketing agency in common that would be set up by the cooperative structure in the United States because, after all, most of the milk does go through the cooperative system. Mm -hmm. We had the idea at that time that by signing a contract with the cooperatives, they could and they should form a marketing agency in common. They could base their price on a contract that had been written by the producers, the members of NFO. Well, this partially came true. A marketing agency in common was formed but really, it never developed to the fullest extent where it really could do something. There were several reasons given to me in the past why the marketing agency in common didn't work. That is the one that was set up, or supposedly to be set up, by the cooperative structure. Mm -hmm. Why didn't it work? Bill, people who were in that uh, group told me this. They said, well, we don't have enough of the total production to be really effective. Mm -hmm. They said, it takes a lot of money. We don't really have the financing. They said, we could go ahead and become another marketing group, uh, similar to small groups that we have today. But then there was one other thing. They said, we're not going to form an agency and either protect or work with some other plant that we don't believe is efficient as ours or probably as large as ours or located in the right area. This meant to me that they were still going to compete among themselves at the expense of the producer. Now, I have another idea why it didn't work. I haven't seen the leadership in the old marketing structure that truthfully, in my opinion, have the best interests of the producer. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's a business out there. They think of the business, but I think they've forgotten the producer out on the farm. Well, certainly a part of where we've been was the milk holding action 
Let's talk about that for a minute, Ed. Why did this happen? This was in what, 1967, the was it? The spring of 1967. Why did it happen? Why did it happen? I think we just explained why it happened, because the marketing agency in common that could have worked and probably should have worked never developed to uh, help the producer. Mm -hmm. There was no, no uh, course that the producer could take unless they showed that they meant business, they were going to take that production and hold it until someone was willing to pay a fair price. If they wouldn't pay that price for it, it had to be dumped. It was going to be destroyed. Yes. But, Bill, this had a tremendous effect. If we remember, you could call for federal order hearings, and you could talk about supply of milk, but it was almost taboo to talk about yes. the price. Remember what happened immediately after the holding action? Federal order hearings were called all over the country. They were called emergency federal order hearings. They talked about price. A seasonal decline in the price of milk that has been taking uh, or coming into effect every year was stopped. But the real important thing about that milk holding action, in my opinion, Bill, was the fact that it sold collective bargaining to the nation and to the world. Well, how was collective bargaining sold to the world, Ed? Well, Bill, people in foreign countries look upon this country, they look upon its tremendous corn crop and the amount of beef and hog production and the amount of dairy production. They had the belief that the producer also was a part of this uh, that was happy, contented, and everything was going well. Mm -hmm. And certainly ambassadors from this country had to be portraying that picture in foreign countries. Now, what do you think those people thought when they saw on their television sets via Telstar the American farmer dumping milk? Then the truth had to be told. These producers out here weren't receiving a fair price. And after all, this is the only thing that is wrong with mm -hmm. American agriculture. It's the price that the producer receives. So collective bargaining wasn't only sold in the nation. It was sold over the entire world by the farmers in that milk holding action had a tremendous impact. Which brings us to where we are today. And uh, when we talk about where we are today, we have to talk about uh, the supply contracts to processors, do we not? Right. Well, let's hear about those, Ed. Bill, a year ago last April, the NFO signed its first supply contracts with uh, processors and handlers of milk. We signed them uh, beginning on the basis that we could create more efficiency within the industry, and we'll always strive for that. Mm -hmm. In other words, we had uh, probably too much brick and mortar. Uh, it couldn't all be utilized. We didn't have the supply of milk, and after all, milk could be transported easily now. We could make more efficient units. So the supply contract, as you remember, was first used in the state of Minnesota, and there were many contracts signed in the state of Wisconsin where we brought the production together, we increased the efficiency of plants, more net dollars were returned to the producer. But at the same time, the effect of these contracts was that the man who did not sign a contract began to lose his supply. Now, anyone put in that position has one of two choices. He can close his doors, or he can begin paying more for the product with the hopes of bringing more into his plant. This automatically had an upward pressure on the price. Now, when you raise the price in Wisconsin and Minnesota, this Wisconsin and Minnesota series price, which is exactly what was happening, you affect the federal order prices all over the nation. So there was a direct benefit beginning a year ago last April and continuing right on through with all of these contracts. There's one more thing that's very important. Approximately six weeks ago, the National Farmers Organization received its qualification as a milk marketing association. Now, really, this is very important because it gives us a chance to represent our producers on the market. This means we can perform the testing, we can market this milk on our weights and tests, and prior to this, we had a big obstacle that encountered us every time we attempted to market milk. What was that, Ed? The major buyers and handlers would say, 
well, we can't buy from you until you're a qualified marketing association. But the Department of Agriculture said, you've got to market milk before we can qualify you. That's being in the vice, I would I say. I would say that's where we were. <laughs> now, we were able to overcome this mm -hmm. by having a, enough of the total supply in areas that buyers just needed our supply. It mm -hmm. came right back to collective bargaining yes. again. Well, Ed, you've told us where we've been and where we are and how we got there. That leaves us only one thing to consider, and that is, where are we going? Bill, we're going in the direction of NFO being that marketing agency in common that we talked about at the beginning of the program. NFO will be that marketing agency in common now we're putting this volume, this supply together through the reload stations and the processors and handlers now buy that production mm -hmm. from the marketing agency in common of NFO. Yes. Ed, during our recent field trip in the east and northeast, you can imagine, since that's predominantly dairy country, that we saw many outstanding dairy operations and met many fine NFO dairy members. One of them was Carlton Greenwood at Westminster, Vermont. Why don't you join me as we go to Westminster and visit with uh, Carlton Greenwood? Fine. Well, now, let's talk a little bit about uh, your place. How many acres do you uh, farm over there? We have about 85 acres. Now, you have it mostly in corn, don't you, Carlton? Every bit of it is in corn. Yeah, now, what do you do? Do you, do you chop that for silage, for, uh, for feed? Yes, this is all chopped for silage and piled in a pile on top of the ground mm -hmm. and covered with plastic. Yes. Now, this, uh, of course, is predominantly dairy country, and you're a dairyman, much the same as uh, Charlie is a dairyman here on the Cabot farm. How big is your herd? Well, we have about 110 head altogether, mm -hmm. and uh, presently we have 57 cows in the milking herd. And the rest is made up of bred heifers and younger animals. These heifers are really fine-looking animals, as well as your cow herd. And very tame, by the way. You know, uh, we enjoyed watching yeah. you go down to uh, feed them out of your bathtubs, which gives <laughs> us an idea for, uh, you know, a mighty yeah. good use for old discarded bathtubs. They work out real well, don't they? Yes, and they've even had their pictures on the front page of the daily paper. Is that right? Eating out of the bathtubs. Yeah. How do you account for the fact that these heifers are as, as tame as they are? Well, when they're very young, uh, we hitch them in the walk behind the milking cows. Uh, the only time they're not there is the day that the milk inspector comes I because see. he doesn't like to see them. <laughs> but outside of that, yeah, yeah. that's where they're grown when they're little. Right. You know, Carlton, we all come from a younger part of the country out in the Midwest. So we've been extremely intrigued with the age of the homes all through the New England states. Now, your home is a most attractive home, and uh, your daughter tells us that uh, it's one of the younger ones, she says. It's only about, uh, oh, 120 or 30 years old, dating back to what, about 1850? Yes, approximately 1850. Yeah. It's a very attractive place. And she said something about the fact that the, the, the siding, the clapboards, uh, you turned them over once and found that they had already been turned over. I yes, guess. That, that's right, yeah. That's very interesting. <laughs> now, your son uh, is a cowman like you, isn't he, Carl? Oh, yes, he's, uh, the bug is bitten him, and uh, you can't help yourself when this happens. Yeah. You're, you're dedicated to cattle. You respect them more than you respect human beings. And uh, there's a, a lot uh, better... Uh, uh, affirmative response from a cow than you'll get from a lot of people. Now, you told me a little while ago about a famous uh, Vermont saying uh, in uh, observation of the fact that in the state of Vermont there are a lot more cows than there are human beings. Well, this was uh, true up until a few years ago, uh -huh. but uh, we've had a few articles uh, published in, uh, well, magazines like Reader's Digest uh, telling everybody what a beautiful state Vermont is. I'm sorry that this uh, article got into the Reader's Digest. but So now we do have more people and cows. Mm -hmm. But for many years, the cow population in Vermont was greater than the human population. And one old farmer was asked uh, how this happened to be, and he said, we prefer them. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you how you first became attracted to NFO. 
Well, I uh, first became attracted to NFO, as I'm sure a great many people did, when my television was on one morning, and I saw the cusses dumping milk in the street. What was your reaction to that at that time? I'll never join the organization. <laughs> I think a lot of people felt that way. Well, I think so. Of course, I could say that uh, uh, guardedly because uh, the bank wouldn't let me anyway. Oh, that's, that was a problem. <laughs> Would you explain that to our viewers? Well, I uh, have to have pretty good production in my heart in order to keep my uh, monthly payments oh, up see. to the bank. So you couldn't afford to do any milk dumping. Then. That's right. Well, my, my reaction to this, is, as I've just said, uh, was negative, and I said that I would never have anything to do with an organization like this, and how wrong I was. <laughs> what happened to change your mind? Well, uh, uh, as, I, I, as I said just a minute ago, uh, I prefer working with cows, people, because uh, there's uh, so much better response. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I found, um, all of a sudden, uh, and this is not uh, uh, true just uh, as far as uh, you know, cattle are concerned, but uh, our social problems today are such that uh, the only real way that we can get recognition, and we don't want it, uh, and it, it seems to me as a last resort is violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is, a, this is a violence which was actually needed uh, we had to, to go this far to get recognition, and we certainly got it. It got the attention. It's like hitting the mule in the head with a two before to get his attention before you speak to him. And I guess that yeah. this is what had to happen. Yeah, that's right. Well, when did you first join, and how did you get around to joining? Well, I attended a, a meeting uh, one evening, and there were uh, some things said that stayed in, in my mind. And uh, one was that in NFO, there are no state lines, there are no county lines, that farmers must work together nationally or even internationally. Uh, this, uh, was, this thought was able to come to me because for many years, I was a member of the Bullis Falls Cooperative Creamery. And uh, for several years, I was a vice president uh, we bottled our milk and sold uh, almost 100% of it to the first national stores in Boston. This started in 1921 and continued until 1966 without a contract. Uh, all during this period, we had uh, a lot of competition. And this competition came from, well, maybe my neighbor, who didn't happen to ship to the Bullis Falls Creamery, but shipped to United Farmers. Their manager was... I know constantly calling at First National Stores, trying to get them to buy the product from, from them and not from us. Mm -hmm. And this finally happened. And uh, this put us out of business. And uh, I could not blame First National Stores because they were buying their product at a lower price than they, they purchased it from us. Mm -hmm. And I, then I realized that as much as I appreciated the benefits that we got from cooperatives, that it was just the same as one farmer working against another, only it was one group against another. And I realized that uh, the farmer would never be able to pull himself up by the bootstraps and get a decent standard of living unless he worked not only with his cooperative, but cooperatives with cooperatives cooperatives and uh, nationally so that uh, we aren't worrying here in Vermont uh, what New York is going to sell its milk for mm -hmm. and uh, worrying for fear that uh, New York will come in if we ask too high a price and uh, we've been constantly in fear uh, to face up to the fact that we had to do our bargaining and marketing for ourselves on a national basis. And this is what convinced me the, that NFO was the answer. Carlton, uh, I know that uh, in recent months, the general attitude clear across the country toward NFO has been changing. Uh, where uh, opposition existed, it's softening. Uh, where deaf ears existed, now there's listening. And uh, 
I know that you came out to greet us today with an article uh, that uh, is indication of the editorial change in publications in attitude toward NFO. What, what article is this and what publication? Well, the article that uh, I was talking about is uh, in the American Agriculturist in the, in the, in the August issue, and this uh, article on F NFO happens to uh, be on page uh, 34, and it, and it says, what is NFO doing? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the comment last night says, well, gee, that was written by a couple of women. I don't know if they're NFO members. Uh, I said, well, I'm glad that somebody, a man or woman, could uh, write an article pointing out uh, the exact benefits that we are getting as NFO members and, and what is, is being accomplished. Uh, just to pick out uh, uh, one a part of this article, it says, why has the NFO uh, program been so successful? For the first time in the history of agriculture, a coordinated bargaining program is operating in all 48 states. And uh, uh, to uh, go on uh, from there, it says the NFO has been able to adjust the movement of agricultural production and prevent low-priced areas from developing. After visiting with uh, Carlton Greenwood, our entire U.S. Farm Report crew went across the river from Carlton's farm into the state of New Hampshire, where we visited on Boggy Meadow Farm, owned by Mr. Henry Cabot, lawyer of Boston, former chairman of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and a new member of NFO. On the Boggy Meadow Farm, we talked with the farm manager, Mr. Charlie Philbrook. How many acres of land uh is in, are involved in the farm. 625. And uh, how are they planted, Charlie? Well, we have 250 in corn and about 100 in hay. Uh -huh. Now, your milk herd is how big at this time? We have 211 milkers. And what about your uh, heifers? Well, we have 35 bird heifers and approximately 100 uh, calf to uh -huh. yielding stage. Have you been doing much culling and improving the herd, or have you really had time? Uh, not to a great extent. Uh, Mr. Cabot takes quite an interest in the herd, and he uh, indicates what animals to stay and go. Yes, yes. Is he a pretty good stockman, pretty good at this kind of thing? I would say yes, very so. He's a man of uh, many activities. He's basically an investment man, is he not? I believe so. And uh, didn't you tell me that he uh, interested in the arts as chairman of the board of the Boston Symphony? Former chairman. Former he, chairman he of the board. Ha he has retired from that yeah. present. How often does he get up to a Boggy Meadow Farm, Charlie? Well, for the major part of the summer and quite often through the winter. One, well, two times a month. Yeah. Would you have any idea how old the mansion is where he lives? Well, I'll refer to Carlton's estimate, somewhere around 1840. And the house that you live in, across the, uh, the boggy meadow, which is now this very productive alfalfa field, I presume is about that same vintage, isn't it? I believe it is, yeah. Well, now, let's get back to this uh, cow herd. What kind of production are you getting at this time? Well, this morning we shipped 6,700, uh, right the present, the her rolling herd average is around 12. Well, you've got a big feed problem here with a herd of that size, and uh, you have big feed facilities. Now, we noticed uh, these, uh, I call them trench silos. Is that what you call them Correct. in this part of the country? Correct. What's the capacity of these two silos? Well, we have one that holds 3,000, and the other one holds 2,500. 3,000 and 2,500 tons. Correct. That's a lot of silage. Yes, it is. And you're making improvements, I notice, up at uh, one end of this silo. What's the purpose of that? Well, that will enable us to feed the cured silage from one end while we're filling the other end. Mm -hmm. Now, we notice with interest uh, a method of uh, feeding molasses, a 
I guess this is a protein supplement, isn't it? That's correct. Uh, that you're uh, using, and uh, these cows really go for those molasses, licking those wheels, and uh, they've learned, I guess, to turn them around to get more molasses right out of the bottom of the tank. That's correct. Yeah. By rolling it, it keeps bringing it up. Well, Charlie, how many men do you uh, have here on your payroll to help you operate this place? Well, we have five able-bodied men and one man with a handicap. Mm -hmm. Paul, well, it's, it's good of you to, to have him around. I think these fellows uh, need jobs, and I, I'll bet you he's doing a good job for you. He's a uh, very good-hearted man. Yes. About you personally, how big a family do you have? I have three boys, two... Uh, 18 and 19 and 111. What uh, what are they going to do, Charlie? Are they going to stay uh, on the farm, or do you think they'll get away from you and go to the urban areas? Well, I believe the older boy will stay with the farm. The younger boy, uh, the 18-year-old boy, hopes to go to the Coast Guard Academy. 11-year-old mm -hmm. boy, this time, is enjoying Little League, etc. <laughs> he doesn't have too much to worry about right now, does he? Uh, well, other than the lawnmower, no. Yes. He takes care of the lawns. In fact, he's not even at the stage where he's uh, interested in girls, I presume. Not to my knowledge. <laughs> Charlie, thank you very much. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. That's Mr. Charlie Philbrook of Boggy Meadow Farm. Ed, here is an example in Vermont and New Hampshire of two neighboring NFO dairy farmers. One, a rather medium-sized dairy farmer in terms of the number of head of cows he milks, the other a substantial and much larger dairy farmer. Can NFO serve both of these people equally in spite of the difference in their sizes? Bill, this proves one thing. There's a necessity for farmers that are comparatively large, medium sized or small, all to join NFO and get into an NFO program. Because really, we talk about a large farmer and he's very small compared to the processor and the handler. Mm -hmm. He may be large compared to his neighbor, but it only points out that if this man were to try and go it alone, he would be saying that he was going to be a begging producer rather than one of a collective bargaining group. Yes. Ed, I want to thank you very much for being my special guest today. Very happy to be here. It's always a pleasure to have you on our show. Thank you. My special guest in the studio on this week's U.S. Farm Report has been Mr. Ed Groff, who is director of the Dairy Commodity Department of NFO. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week on this station at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody.